Islamic sexual jurisprudence concerns the Islamic laws of sexuality in Islam, as largely predicated on the Quran, the sayings of Muhammad hadith, and the rulings of religious leaders fatwa, confining sexual activity to marital relationships between men and women. While most traditions discourage celibacy, all encourage strict chastity, modesty and privacy with regard to any relationships between genders, holding forth that their intimacy is perceived within Islam, encompassing a swath of life broader than sexual activity, is largely reserved for marriage. This sensitivity to gender difference and modesty outside of marriage can be seen in current prominent aspects of Islam, such as interpretations of Islamic dress and degrees of gender segregation. While prohibitions against extramarital sex are strong, sexual activity itself is not a taboo subject. Permissible sexual relationships are described in Quran and Hadith as great wells of love and closeness. Even after marriage, there are limitations, a man should not have intercourse during his wife's menstruation and afterbirth periods. He is also considered to be sinning when penetrating anally. Islam itself is a natalist religion, therefore it encourages increasing procreation through marital sexual relationships. Actions and behaviors such as abortion other than for medical risk to the pregnant woman and homosexuality are also strictly forbidden. Temporary contraceptive use is permitted for birth control. Topic: <laughs> Sex education. Topic: <laughs> Adult Muslim men and women asked Muhammad about issues concerning sexual behavior, so as to know the teachings and rulings of their religion. Muslims could pose their questions either to Muhammad directly or to his wives. A hadith attributed to Muhammad's wife Aisha states that the Ansar women in particular were not shy about asking questions regarding sexual matters. Topic. Children Parents are responsible for the upbringing of their children, and that responsibility includes protecting them from anything that may corrupt their morals. Early sex education for children is not recommended by Islamic scholars, as the knowledge contained in such curricula may be a negative influence on a young child's mind. According to Muhammad al Munajid, young children should instead be taught Islamic rules involving covering the aura, controlling one's gaze, and asking permission before entering private spaces. Munajid also suggested to separate the bed of children at the age of 10 according to Hadith. It was narrated from Amr ibn Shu'ayb, from his father, that his grandfather said, The Messenger of Allah blessings and peace of Allah be upon him said, Instruct your children to pray when they are seven years old, and smack them if they do not do it when they are ten years old, and separate them in their beds. Sheikh Muhammad Shams al-Haq al-Azimabadi said, al Manawi said in Fath al Qadir Shar al Jami as Sagir, that is, separate your children in the beds in which they sleep when they reach the age of ten, as a precaution against provocation of desire, even in the case of sisters. At TB said, Allah mentioned together the ideas of instructing them to pray and separating them in their beds in childhood, so as to discipline them and obey all the commands of Allah, and to teach them, to show them proper etiquette with people, and to teach them not to put themselves in suspicious situations and to keep away from sin. Munajid stated, this advice and guidance from this verse has to do with protecting and concealing the aura and avoiding provocation of desire which begins, as we have seen, in the tenth year, which is the age at which most children reach discernment. When puberty approaches, children should be taught the signs of puberty and the characteristics which distinguish men from women, and the types of discharge that may be emitted from the front passage of both sexes. They should also be taught the rulings on wudu and ghusl, paying attention to the phrases used in teaching and ensuring that it is taught according to what the child needs to know. Munajid has maintained two as important matters which should begin at a very early age, around the age of three years, that have a basic connection to the issue of sex education. They are The necessity for the boy or girl to be able to distinguish between male and female. Confusion between them at that early age could lead to troubles and confusion in concepts, characteristics and actions, in both sexes. Hence it is essential to make a boy understand that he cannot wear his sister's clothes, or wear earrings or bracelets, because these are for females, not for males. By the same token, a girl should be told similar things about her brother's actions and characteristics, teaching children that the aura is private, and that it should not be uncovered for anyone. 
Teaching them this, and bringing them up with it, is a way of instilling in them the characteristics of chastity and modesty, and will help prevent perverts from transgressing against them. Finally, he stated, with regard to the issue of sex education having to do with intercourse, or what happens between spouses in general, this should come when there is a need for it, such as when marriage is approaching, or when he is mature enough to understand some issues of fic, such as the rulings on xena, fornication or adultery, and the like, which have to do with intercourse and auras. It should be noted that what is needed of that knowledge is basically something that is natural and instinctive in the first place, and what you need to point out must be taught to children gradually, in accordance with the stages of their development, by means of lessons of fic, study circles and classes in school. We should be conservative in the words and phrases we use, and attention must be paid to the appropriate ages and stages to discuss this topic. We must also warn against the promiscuous practices of the disbelievers and contrast them with the beauty of Islam, with regard to urging Muslims to cover up and be modest, and to guard their chastity and avoid that which is haram. Topic. Circumcision Khitan or Khatna Arabic, Khatan Arabic, countant is the term for male circumcision carried out as a cultural rite by Muslims and is considered a sign of belonging to the wider Islamic community. Whether or not it should be carried out after converting to Islam is debated among Islamic scholars. The Quran itself does not mention circumcision explicitly in any verse. Some hadith mention circumcision in a list of practices known as fitra acts considered to be of a refined person. Abu Huraira, a companion of Muhammad, was quoted saying, Five things are fitra, circumcision, shaving pubic hair with a razor, trimming the mustache, paring one's nails and plucking the hair from one's armpits." So, despite its absence from the Quran, it has been a religious custom from the beginning of Islam. However, there are other hadiths which do not name circumcision as part of the characteristics of fitra and yet another hadith which names ten characteristics, again without naming circumcision. In Sahih Muslim, Aisha is quoted, The Messenger of Allah may peace be upon him said, Ten are the acts according to fitra, clipping the mustache, letting the beard grow, using toothpicks, snuffing water in the nose, cutting the nails, washing the finger joints, plucking the hair under the armpits, shaving pubic hair and cleaning one's private parts with water. The narrator said, I have forgotten the tenth, but it may have been rinsing the mouth. Hence, the different hadiths do not correspond on whether circumcision is part of fitra or not. According to some traditions Muhammad was born without a foreskin a while others maintain that his grandfather Abdul Muttalib circumcised him when he was seven days old. Many of his early disciples were circumcised to symbolize their inclusion within the emerging Islamic community. Amongst ulema Muslim legal scholars, there are differing opinions about the compulsion of circumcision in Sharia Islamic law. Imams Abu Hanifa, founder of the Hanafi school of fiqh Islamic jurisprudence, and Malik ibn Anas, maintain that circumcision is a sunnah mu'akkadah, not obligatory but highly recommended. The Shafi backquote I and Hanbali schools see it as binding on all Muslims. Islamic sources do not fix a particular time for circumcision. It depends on family, region and country. A majority of ulema however take the view that parents should get their child circumcised before the age of 10. The preferred age is usually seven although some Muslims are circumcised as early as on the seventh day after birth and as late as at the commencement of puberty. Topic. Puberty Bali or Buluk Arabic, Balg or Bulk refers to a person who has reached maturity or puberty, and has full responsibility under Islamic law. For example, in issues pertaining to marriage, Bali is related to the Arabic legal expression, Hada Tutakal Rijal, which means that a wedding may not take place until the girl is physically fit to engage in sexual intercourse. In comparison, Bali or Balagat concerns the reaching of sexual maturity which becomes manifest by the menses. The age related to these two concepts can, but need not necessarily, coincide. Only after a separate condition called rushid, or intellectual maturity to handle one's own property, is reached can a girl receive her bridewealth. A boy may reach maturity from the age of 10 lunar years, 9 years, 8 months and 20 days, and will be considered mature at the age of 15 lunar years, 14 years, 6 months and 22 days, if no signs of maturity are found. Signs of maturity for a boy include, wet dreams and ejaculation. 
A girl may reach maturity from the age of nine lunar years, approximately eight years and eight months, and will be considered mature at the age of 15 lunar years, 14 years, six months, and 22 days, if no signs of maturity are found. Signs of maturity for a girl: menstruation, wet dream, or pregnancy. Topic: <laughs> Modesty, chastity, and privacy. Islam has strongly emphasized the concept of conservatism, decency and modesty. Besides the lawful sexuality, priority is given to modesty and chastity both inside and outside the marital relationships. In the hadith literature, modesty has been described as a part of faith. Modesty is verily required in the interaction between members of the opposite sex and in some case between the members of same sex also. Dress code is part of that overall teaching. In Quran, the subjects deal with modesty and privacy of men and women has been mostly described in An-Nur. For example, it has been mentioned, Say to the believing men that they lower their gaze and restrain their sexual passions. That is pure for them. Surely Allah is aware of what they do. And say to the believing women that they lower their gaze and restrain their sexual passions and do not display their adornment except what appears thereof and let them wear their head coverings over their bosoms. And they should not display their adornment except to their husbands or their fathers, or the fathers of their husbands, or their sons, or the sons of their husbands, or their brothers, or their brothers' sons, or their sisters' sons, or their women, or those whom their right hands possess, or guileless male servants, or the children who know not women's nakedness. And let them not strike their feet so that the adornment that they hide may be known and turn to Allah all, O believers, so that you may be successful. And marry those among you who are single, and those who are fit among your male slaves and your female slaves. If they are needy, Allah will make them free from want out of His grace. And Allah is ample giving, knowing. And let those who cannot find a match keep chaste, until Allah makes them free from want out of His grace. O oh, you who believe, let those whom your right hands possess and those of you who have not attained to puberty ask permission of you three times, before the morning prayer, and when you put off your clothes for the heat of noon, and after the prayer of night. These are three times of privacy for you, besides these it is no sin for you nor for them, some of you go round about waiting upon others. Thus does Allah make clear to you the messages. And Allah is knowing, wise. And when the children among you attain to puberty, let them seek permission as those before them sought permission. Thus does Allah make clear to you his messages. And Allah is knowing, wise. And as for women past childbearing, who hope not for marriage, it is no sin for them if they put off their clothes without displaying their adornment. And if they are modest, it is better for them. And Allah is hearing, knowing. There is no blame on the blind man, nor any blame on the lame, nor blame on the sick, nor on yourselves that you eat in your own houses, or your father's houses, or your mother's houses, or your brother's houses, or your sister's houses, or your paternal uncle's houses, or your paternal aunt's houses, or your maternal uncle's houses, or your maternal aunt's houses, or houses whereof you possess the keys, or your friends' houses. It is no sin in you that you eat together or separately. So when you enter houses, greet your people with a salutation from Allah, blessed and goodly. Thus does Allah make clear to you the messages that you may understand. Hadith also describes the laws of modesty. Along with Quran it has also emphasized marriage as a requirement for modesty and chastity. For example, Narrated by Abdullah ibn Masud, the Prophet said, O young men, whoever among you can afford to get married, let him do so, as it lower the eyesight and guard his modesty and whoever cannot afford it, let him fast, for that will be a shield for him." It has been mentioned in hadith ranging about men's and women's private parts that Regarding women follows ASMA, daughter of Abu Bakr, entered upon the Apostle of Allah peace underscore be underscore upon underscore him wearing thin clothes. The Apostle of Allah peace underscore be underscore upon underscore him turned his attention from her. He said, O ASMA, when a woman reaches the age of menstruation, it does not suit her that she displays her parts of body except this and this, and he pointed to her face and hands. Abu Dawud. 
After Muhammad issued the command Quran for women to cover themselves, the women responded by tearing up sheets or outer garments to cover their faces. Sahih Bukhari 60 Regarding men follows Narrated by Muawiyah ibn Hayda I said, Apostle of Allah, from whom should we conceal our private parts and to whom can we show? He replied, Conceal your private parts except from your wife and from whom your right hand possesses concubines. I then asked, Apostle of Allah, what should we do, if the people are assembled together? He replied, If it is within your power then no one will look at it, then you should try that no one can look it. I then asked, Apostle of Allah, if one of us is alone? He replied, Allah is more entitled than people that bashfulness should be shown to him feel shy more to Allah than to people. Narrated Jarhad, the Apostle of Allah peace underscore be underscore upon underscore him sat with us and my thigh was uncovered. He said, do you not know that thigh is a private part? The Prophet peace underscore be underscore upon underscore him said, do not uncover you thigh, and do not look at the thigh of the living and the dead. It is forbidden for both spouses to spread the secrets of what happens between them in their private marital life, indeed, this is one of the most evil things. Quran says, So the good women are obedient, guarding the unseen as Allah has guarded. And also the Muhammad said, Among the most evil of people before Allah on the day of resurrection will be a man who comes to his wife and has intercourse with her, then he spreads her secrets. It was reported from ASMAA bint Yazid that she was with the Prophet peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and men and women were sitting with him, and the Prophet peace and blessings of Allah be upon him said, Would any man say what he did with his wife? Would any woman tell others what she did with her husband? The people kept quiet and did not answer. I ASMAA said, Yes, by Allah, O Messenger of Allah, they women do that, and they men do that. He said, Do not do that. It is like a male devil meeting a female devil in the road and having intercourse with her whilst the people are watching. Allah's Messenger said, The most wicked among the people in the eye of Allah on the Day of Judgment is the man who goes to his wife and she comes to him, and then he divulges her secret to others. Privacy between unmarried man and woman is not allowed following. The Prophet said, No man alone with an unknown woman but the shaitan evil is the third one present. The following hadiths also commands maintaining basic privacy in societal gathering. Narrated by Abu Sa'id Qudri, the Prophet said, A man should not look at the private part of another man, and a woman should not look at the private parts of another woman. A man should not lie with another man without wearing lower garment under one cover, and a woman should not lie with another woman without wearing lower garment under one cover. In another hadith, it has been mentioned, the Messenger of Allah said, Instruct your children to pray when they are seven years old, and smack them if they do not do it when they are ten years old, and separate them in their beds. There is also prescription of modesty and privacy in case of unlawful sexual acts. It is mentioned in the hadith below from Muwatta Imam Malik. Malik related to me from Zayd ibn Aslam that a man confessed to fornication in the time of the Messenger of Allah, may Allah bless him and grant him peace. The Messenger of Allah, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, called for a whip, and he was brought a broken whip. He said, Above this, and he was brought a new whip whose knots had not been cut yet. He said, Below this, and he was brought a whip which had been used and made flexible. The Messenger of Allah, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, gave the order and he was flogged. Then he said, People, the time has come for you to observe the limits of Allah. Whoever has had any of these ugly things befall him should cover them up with the veil of Allah. Whoever reveals to us his wrong action, we perform what is in the Book of Allah against him. Some hadith warn against immodesty, including as follows. The Messenger of Allah said, There are five things with which you will be tested, and I seek refuge with Allah lest you live to see them. Promiscuity sexual immorality never appears among a people to such an extent that they commit it openly, but plagues and diseases that were never known among the predecessors will spread among them. Marriage 
Marriage is a contract between Muslim men and his wife. Marriage has been described in tradition hadith as half of the religion with the regards of preserving chastity. Anas ibn Malik reported, the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, said, whoever Allah provides with a righteous wife, then Allah has assisted him in half of his religion. Let him fear Allah regarding the second half. Topic. Sex within marriage In Islamic law, marriage legalizes sexual intercourse between the husband and wife. Marriage is not restricted to a platonic relationship nor is it only for procreation. Marriage is greatly encouraged in Islam, partially because it provides a lawful institution in which to fulfill one's sexual urges. Islam does provide extensive rules regarding sex, however, within the conditional institution of marriage, there are sources in both the Quran and Hadith, which promote the well-being of humans and their natural sexual instincts. In the Surah Baqara, sex in married life is openly recommended. When they e. wives, have cleansed themselves after menstruation, you go into them as Allah has commanded. It has been also said. Those who guard their chastity i.e. private parts, from illegal sexual acts except from their wives or the captives and slaves that their right hands possess, for them, they are free from blame." Additionally, sources of hadith illustrate similar promotion of fulfilling sexual urges in lawful ways within a marriage. The Wasailish Shia quotes Muhammad as encouraging his followers to marry, saying, Oh, you young men! I recommend marriage to you. Prophet Muhammad also declared marital sex as charity. When one of you have sex with your wife, it is a rewarded act of charity. Quote. The companions were surprised and said, but we do it purely out of our desire. How can it be counted as charity? The Prophet replied, if you had done it with a forbidden woman, it would have been counted as a sin, but if you do it in legitimacy, it is counted as charity. Topic sexual techniques One of the areas of Islamic sexual jurisprudence in which there are not many restrictions is the discussion of sexual techniques. Almost all of what is practiced under Islamic law concerning sexual techniques and the act of sexual intercourse come from hadith, which are not restrictive in nature, but followed by a mutual etiquette known as foreplay. As the hadith follows, Imam al dalami records a narration on the authority of Anas ibn Malik that the Messenger of Allah, Allah bless him and give him peace, is reported to have said, Not one of you should fulfill one's sexual need from fall upon his wife like an animal, but let there first be a messenger between you, and what is that messenger? they asked. And he replied, kisses and words. Imam ibn al Qayyim reports from Habir ibn Abd Allah in his famous Tib al Nabawi that the Messenger of Allah, Allah bless him and give him peace, forbade from engaging in sexual intercourse before foreplay. The main tendency within these hadith are saying for Muslims to follow in the bedroom, saying which clearly show that the husband and the wife should feel completely free when they are engaged in mutual stimulation, which is known as foreplay. These sayings recommend foreplay and put no real restrictions on the type of techniques used during foreplay or during intercourse. Allah says in the Quran, Your wives are a tilth for you, so go to your tilth have sexual relations with your wives in any manner as long as it is in the vagina and not in the anus, when or how you will, and send good deeds, or ask Allah to bestow upon you pious offspring for your own selves beforehand. And fear Allah, and know that you are to meet him in the hereafter, and give good tidings to the believers O Muhammad. In the foregoing verse the word hearth tilt indicates that any kind of vaginal sex is permissible in Islam, because it is from this place children are produced, and it is also regardless any of sexual positions, because although top to bottom position has been encouraged most, but none of the vaginal sexual positions has been mentioned as prohibited in scripture and tradition. The semen lodged in the womb from which offspring comes is likened to the seeds that are planted in the ground, bringing vegetation. Both of them are substances from which something else is produced. Hence, conversely, one area of sexual techniques that is generally prohibited is anal intercourse. All Muslim jurists agree that anal sex is haram prohibited, based on the hadith of Muhammad, do not have anal sex with women. Muhammad also said, Cursed he, dot who has sex with a woman through her back passage. Kuzayma ibn Thabit also reported that the Messenger of Allah said, Allah is not too shy to tell you the truth, do not have sex with your wives in the anus." Ibn Abbas narrated, The Messenger of Allah said, Allah will not look at a man who has anal sex with his wife. Further, it is reported that Muhammad referred to such an act as, minor sodomy, 
Reported by Ahmad and an It is reported that Umar ibn al Khattab came one day to Muhammad and said, O Messenger of Allah, I am ruined. What has ruined you? asked the Prophet. He replied, Last night I turned my wife over, meaning that he had had vaginal intercourse with her from the back. The Prophet did not say anything to him until the verse cited above was revealed. Then he told him, Make love with your wife from the front or the back, but avoid the anus and intercourse during menstruation. Reported by Ahmad and at Tirmidhi. Topic: <laughs> Sexual obligations. In Islam, the husband should have intercourse with his wife according to what satisfies her, so long as that does not harm him physically or keep him from earning a living. The husband is obliged to treat his wife in a kind and reasonable manner. Part of that kind and reasonable treatment is intercourse, which he has to do. The majority of scholars set the time limit beyond which it is not permissible for the husband to forego intercourse at four months, but according to some scholars, the view is that there is no time limit. Most of the scholars have said that, it is obligatory on women alike not to refuse their husbands if they call them, so long as the woman who is called is not menstruating or sick in such a way that intercourse will be harmful to her, or observing an obligatory fast. If she refuses with no excuse, then she is cursed. It was narrated from Abu Huraira that the Prophet said, If a man calls his wife to his bed, and she refuses to come, the angels curse her until morning comes. But it is not permissible for a husband to force his wife to do more than she is able to bear of intercourse. If she has an excuse such as being sick or unable to bear it, then she is not sinning if she refuses to have intercourse. Topic. Procreation. In Islamic jurisprudence, the primary purpose of sex between marriage is procreation. Islam recognizes the strong sexual urge and desire for reproduction. Dr. M. A. Raouf from his book, Marriage in Islam. In this excerpt, he discusses in great detail the advantages and possible disadvantages of marriage. Among the advantages that he discusses are procreation, fulfillment of the natural urge, companionship, comfort and relief to the soul, and so on. He also discusses the disadvantages and the types of burdens and risks involved with marriage. All of the advantages or benefits are in effect meant to be regarded as the secondary purpose of marriage which supplement its major aim or purpose, namely procreation. To beget children. This is the main purpose for marriage. The aim is to engender and preserve the human race. Four objectives are accomplished through procreation, i. to increase mankind e. Islam is propagated by increasing the number of followers of the Prophet Muhammad e. parents will hope to leave behind children who will pray for them IV. and according to Islamic belief, if a child dies before the parents, the prayers of the child in paradise will be very beneficial for the parents. The children born of the matrimonial union become legitimate and mutual rights of inheritance are established. Islam also supposes a pro-natalist view of procreation through many hadith. Makhl ibn Yasar said, A man came to the Prophet peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and said, I have found a woman who is of good lineage and is beautiful, but she does not children. Should I marry her? He said, No. Then he came again with the same question and he told him not to marry her. Then he came a third time with the same question and he said, Marry those who are loving and fertile, for I will be proud of your great numbers before the other nations. This hadith indicates that it is encouraged to marry women who are fertile, so that the numbers of the Ummah will increase, and so the Prophet Muhammad will feel proud of his followers before all other nations. This shows that it is encouraged to have a lot of children. Narrated, Abdullah, we used to participate in the holy battles led by Allah's Messenger and we had nothing no wives, with us. So we said, Shall we get ourselves castrated? He forbade us that and then allowed us to marry women with a temporary contract, too, and recited to us, O you who believe. Make not unlawful the good things which Allah has made lawful for you, but commit no transgression. 5.87 Narrated Abu Huraira, I said, O Allah's messenger, I am a young man and I am afraid that I may commit illegal sexual intercourse and I cannot afford to marry. He kept silent, and then repeated my question once again, but he kept silent. I said the same for the third time and he remained silent. Then repeated my question for the fourth time, and only then the Prophet said, O oh Abu Huraira, the pen has dried after writing what you are going to confront. So, it does not matter whether you get yourself castrated or not.
The Messenger of Allah said, "'Marriage is part of my sunnah, and whoever does not follow my sunnah has nothing to do with me. Get married, for I will boast of your great numbers before the nations. Whoever has the means, let him get married, and whoever does not, then he should fast for it will diminish his desire." The Messenger of Allah disapproved of Uthman bin Mazan's desire to remain celibate. If he had given him permission, we would have gotten ourselves castrated. The Messenger of Allah forbade celibacy. Zayd bin Aqzam added, and Qatada recited, and indeed we sent messengers before you, O Muhammad, and made for them wives and offspring. Topic: <laughs> Fornication and adultery. Just as Islamic law fosters sexual actions within a marriage or lawful concubinage with wholly owned female slaves, there is also judicial opinion concerning sexual relations outside of these institutions. These laws, however, observe much stricter restrictions. Additionally, these laws have textual confirmation from the Quran. Fornicatoress and fornicator flog each one of them one hundred lashes, and do not take pity on them in the application of God's law if you believe in God and last day, and their punishment should be witnesses by a party of believers. Fornicator does not marry except a fornicatoress or polytheist women, and fornicatoress no one marry her except fornicator or polytheist man, and it is prohibited to believers. And those who accuse chaste women and then never bring four witness flog them eighty lashes, and do not accept their testimony forever, they themselves are disobedient. Except those who repent after this and become good then God is forgiving and merciful. And those who accuse their wives and do not have witness except themselves then witness of each of them are four witnesses by God that he is of truthfuls. And fit that curse of God be on him if he is of leer and it can save her from punishment that she witnesses by God four times that he is of liars. And fifth time that wrath of God be on her if he is of truthfuls. Al Quran 24-2-9 Verse 24-2-3 states that outside marriage and concubinage, Islamic law prohibits sexual relations as zina fornication. Verse 24-2-3 establishes that male and female fornicators are to be flogged 100 times. According to Hadith, married male and female fornicators are to be stoned to death. Furthermore, one practice outside marriage that does exist within Islamic law is legal sexual relations between a man and an unmarried female slave whom he owns. Malik ibn Anas cites a report in which, Umar b. al Khattab says that when a female slave gives birth to a child by her master, then the slave becomes an um walad, mother of a child, concubine. Topic. Illegal sex fornication. Similar to laws that prohibit extramarital sexual relations, the Quran also stipulates categories of women with whom men are prohibited from engaging in sexual intercourse. Verse 422-4 lists mothers, daughters, sisters, aunts, nieces, wet nurses, wet nurses' daughters, wives' mothers, daughters of wives from different fathers, wives of sons, and women already married. Additionally, verse 2 to 222 prohibits sexual relations with women during menstruation. Muhammad specifically restricts the injunction to segregate the women and not go near them in 2 to 222 to a prohibition against sexual relations with menstruating women. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Pornography. Pornography is considered haram and a clear sin. The Quran states, Tell the faithful men to cast down their looks and to guard their private parts. Tell the faithful women to cast down their looks and to guard their private parts, and not to display their charms except what is apparent thereof and put their scarves over their bosoms. Topic. Prostitution Prostitution is banned in Islam. Quran states, And compel not your slave girls to prostitution when they desire to keep chaste, in order to seek the frail goods of this world's life. And whoever compels them, then surely after their compulsion Allah is forgiving, merciful. Prostitution trading sex for money, is haram. If any does this then he shall be stoned to death. It was practiced by some Arabs during the 6th century. In the 7th century, Muhammad declared that prostitution is forbidden on all grounds. Habir reported that Abdullah b. Ubay b. Salul used to say to his slave girl, 
Go and fetch something for us by committing prostitution. It was in this connection that Allah, the Exalted and Glorious, revealed this verse. Quote, and compel not your slave girls to prostitution when they desire to keep chaste in order to seek the frail goods of this world's life, and whoever compels them, then surely after their compulsion Allah is forgiving, merciful." XXIV, 33. Narrated Abdullah ibn Abbas The Prophet said, there is no prostitution in Islam. If anyone practiced prostitution in pre-Islamic times, the child will be attributed to the master of the slave woman. He who claims his child without a valid marriage or ownership will neither inherit nor be inherited. In Islam, prostitution is considered a sin, and Abu Masa'id al-Ansari is attributed with the saying, Allah's apostle forbade taking the price of a dog, money earned by prostitution and the earnings of a soothsayer. Narrated Urwa bin Az Zubair Aisha, the wife of the Prophet told him that there were four types of marriage during pre-Islamic period of ignorance. One type was similar to that of the present day i.e. a man used to ask somebody else for the hand of a girl under his guardianship or for his daughter's hand, and give her mar and then marry her. The second type was that a man would say to his wife after she had become clean from her period, send for so and so and have sexual intercourse with him. Her husband would then keep away from her and would never sleep with her till she got pregnant from the other man with whom she was sleeping. When her pregnancy became evident, he husband would sleep with her if he wished. Her husband did so i.e. let his wife sleep with some other man so that he might have a child of noble breed. Such marriage was called as al-istibda. Another type of marriage was that a group of less than ten men would assemble and enter upon a woman, and all of them would have sexual relation with her. If she became pregnant and delivered a child and some days had passed after delivery, she would send for all of them and none of them would refuse to come, and when they all gathered before her, she would say to them, You all know what you have done, and now I have given birth to a child. So, it is your child so and so. Naming whoever she liked, and her child would follow him and he could not refuse to take him. The fourth type of marriage was that many people would enter upon a lady and she would never refuse anyone who came to her. Those were the prostitutes who used to fix flags at their doors as sign, and he who would wished, could have sexual intercourse with them. If any one of them got pregnant and delivered a child, then all those men would be gathered for her and they would call the kaif persons skilled in recognizing the likeness of a child to his father to them and would let the child follow the man whom they recognized as his father and she would let him adhere to him and be called his son. The man would not refuse all that. But when Muhammad was sent with the truth, he abolished all the types of marriages observed in pre-Islamic period of ignorance except the type of marriage the people recognize today. However, sexual slavery as concubinage was not considered prostitution and was very common during the Arab slave trade throughout the Middle Ages and early modern period, when women and girls from the Caucasus, Africa, Central Asia and Europe were captured and served as concubines in the harems of the Arab world. Ibn Battuta tells us several times that he was given or purchased female slaves. According to Shia Muslims, Muhammad sanctioned fixed term marriage, mudas in Iraq and saya in Iran which has instead been used as a legitimizing cover for sex workers, in a culture where prostitution is otherwise forbidden. By contrast, in the Sahih al Bukhari, muta marriage is classed as forbidden because Ali bin Abu Talib said that he heard Muhammad say that it is forbidden. As narrated by Ali bin Abu Talib, on the day of Kaibar, Allah's apostle forbade the muta i.e. temporary marriage and the eating of donkey meat. Zaidi Shia texts also state that Ali said muta marriage was forbidden and for this reason the Zaidi Shia do not practice muta marriage. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Homosexuality. The Quran strictly prohibits homosexuality through the story of Lot. See verses 7 to 80 minus 84, 26 to 165 minus 166, 11 to 69 minus 83, 29 to 28 minus 35 of the Quran, which is also rendered in the biblical book of Genesis, in Al Nisa, Al Araf, and possibly verses in other surahs. For example, this was the verse addressed directly to Muhammad and his followers. We also sent Lot, he said to his people, Do ye commit lewdness such as no people in creation ever committed before you? For ye practice your lusts on men in preference to women, ye are indeed a people transgressing beyond bounds. In another verse, it has been also pointed out, 
Do you approach males among the worlds and leave what your Lord has created for you as mates? But you are a people transgressing. If two men among you are guilty of lewdness, punish them both. If they repent and amend, leave them alone, for Allah is oft returning, most merciful. The Hadiths consider homosexuality as zina, and male homosexuals to be punished with death. For example, Abu Dawud states, Narrated Abdullah ibn Abbas, the Prophet said, If you find anyone doing as Lot's people did, kill the one who does it, and the one to whom it is done. Narrated Abdullah ibn Abbas, If a man who is not married is seized committing sodomy, he will be stoned to death. It was narrated that Jabir, the Prophet said, There is nothing I fear for my followers more than the deed of the people of Lot. All major Islamic schools disapprove of homosexuality, Islam views same-sex desires as an unnatural temptation, and, sexual relations are seen as a transgression of the natural role and aim of sexual activity. Islamic teachings in the Hadith tradition presume same-sex attraction, extol abstention and in the Quran condemn consummation. Most of the jurists believe there should be severe punishments according to the above Quranic and prophetic orders, such as death or floggings, while some others disagree. Early caliphs were known to have had both of the male partners executed in various ways. Some other jurists believe that there is no punishment that will serve as an effective purgative for this act, and therefore its immorality precludes an earthly punishment. Some jurists are so morally offended by homosexuality that just the discussion around it is cause for excommunication and anathematizing. Islamic law establishes two categories of legal, sexual relationships, between husband and wife and between a man and his concubine. All other sexual relationships, according to Islamic law and exegesis of the Quran, are considered zina, fornication, including adultery and homosexuality. The discourse on homosexuality in Islam is primarily concerned with activities between men. There are, however, a few hadith mentioning homosexual behavior in women. The jurists are agreed that there is no had punishment for lesbianism because it is not zina. Rather, a tazir punishment must be imposed because it is a sin. Although punishment for lesbianism is rarely mentioned in the histories, Al-Tabari records an example of the casual execution of a pair of lesbian slave girls in the harem of Al-Hadi, in a collection of highly critical anecdotes pertaining to that caliph's actions as ruler. Some jurists viewed sexual intercourse as possible only for an individual who possesses a phallus, hence those definitions of sexual intercourse that rely on the entry of as little of the corona of the phallus into a partner's orifice. Since women do not possess a phallus and cannot have intercourse with one another, they are, in this interpretation, physically incapable of committing zina. <inaudible> Gender non-conforming people Mukhanathan effeminate ones. Men who resemble women singular Mukhanath were men who acted in ways interpreted as feminine. As time went on, the Mukhanathan were forced to be castrated. There has been significant mention of Mukhanathan in a hadith and by scholars of Islam. The word refers to a person who behaves like a woman in gentleness, speech, appearance, movements and so on. The Mukhanath or effeminate man is one who is obviously male, unlike the kuntha intersex. Effeminate people are of two types. I those who are created that way intersex, there is no sin on them. E. Those who were not created that way, rather they choose to imitate women in their movements and speech. This is the type which is cursed in the hadiths. The following tradition speaks to the their behavior. Narrated by Abdullah ibn Abbas, the Prophet cursed effeminate men, those men who are in the similitude assume the manners of women and those women who assume the manners of men, and he said, Turn them out of your houses. The Prophet turned out such and such man, and Umar turned out such and such woman. Sex change operation means that healthy males or females suffering from no deformity, who are able to marry and reproduce, choose to undergo elective surgery to transform themselves into the appearance of the opposite sex. This kind of surgery is prohibited by Islamic law because it is altering Allah's creation needlessly and in vanity. Allah relates that Satan says, and I shall order them and they will alter Allah's creation. It is also the most extreme form of imitating the opposite sex. Islamic prophet Muhammad said, Allah curses men who imitate women and women who imitate men. Intersex 
An intersex person may have sex characteristics or organs that are not typically male or female. This person is called a kuntha in the books of Fik. There are three types of kuntha. 1. A person has aspects of both organs, and urinates from the male organ. This person will be included among the males and the laws regarding males will fall on him. 2. The person urinates from the female organ so will be included among the females. The laws related to females will fall on this person. This applies before the person reaches maturity. After maturity, the person will be rechecked. If he experiences wet dreams like a male then he will be counted as a male. On the other hand, if the person develops breasts and other signs of being feminine the she will be included among the females. 3. When both masculine and feminine signs are equal and it cannot be determined whether the person is more male or more female then such a person is termed kuntha mushkal. There are different laws regarding such a person, a few examples, it is not permissible for a kuntha mushkal to wear silk and jewelry. Both these are permissible for females. But because this person's condition cannot be ascertained, so precaution demands that such a person not wear silk and jewelry, because of the possibility that the person may be more male. Such a person cannot travel without a marum because of the possibility of being more female. When this person dies, gusel will not be given because the question arises that who will render the gusel, male or female. The law is that this person will be given tayamum. If a ghayr marum is rendering the tayamum then the person has to wear a cloth over the hands. A marum does not have to wear a cloth over the hands, with regard to marriage of one who is intersex, if it is an unambiguous case, then according to how he or she is classified, he or she may marry someone of the opposite gender. If it is an ambiguous case, then the marriage of such a person cannot be valid, the reason being that he may be male, in which case how can he marry another male, or may be female, in which case she can't marry another female like her. If this individual is sexually attracted to females and claims to be a man, this is a sign that he is most likely male, and vice versa. Intersex medical interventions are considered permissible to achieve agreement between a person's exterior, chromosomal makeup or sex organs. They are regarded as treatment and not the altering of Allah's creation or imitation of the opposite sex. Topic. Concubinage Concubinage was a relationship between a man and an unmarried female slave whom he owns, the term refers to the status of the female. If she gives birth to a child by her master, the slave becomes um wilad, mother of child, concubine. The Hanbali jurist Ibn Qadama explains that the father is not allowed to sell or transfer ownership of his concubine, though he is entitled to have sexual relations with her, to employ her service, to hire her out and to marry her. Ibn al-Humam adds that the slave owner must acknowledge the kinship of the child. Concubine Surya refers to the female slave Jariya, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, with whom her master engages in sexual intercourse. The word Surya is not mentioned in the Quran. However, the expression, Ma Malakat Amanukam, that which your right hands own, which occurs fifteen times in the sacred book, refers to slaves and therefore, though not necessarily, to concubines. Concubinage was a pre Islamic custom that was allowed to be practiced under Islam with Jews and non Muslim people to marry concubine after teaching her and instructing her well and then giving them freedom. Islamic jurisprudence sets limits on the master's right to sexual intercourse with his female slave. A man's ownership of his unmarried slave girl gave him an exclusive right to have sex with her that he could not sell to others in order to prevent prostitution of slaves. A man could own a limitless number of concubines, but could not have access to the slave girls owned by his wife. Marriage between the master and his concubine was only possible if she was granted free status first. To avoid pregnancies, the master had the right to practice coitus interruptus. The birth of progeny would change the legal status of the concubine to that of Umm al-Walad, mother of the child. As such, the concubine could not then be sold. On the lawful death of her master, she would automatically acquire free status and her children would be considered free and legitimate. Surah al muminin 23-6 and Surah al-Maraj 70-30 both, in identical wording, draw a distinction between spouses and those whom one's right hands possess. Female slaves, saying, Aswajiham a ma malakat amanuam, literally, their spouses or what their right hands possess, while clarifying that sexual intercourse with either is permissible. 
The purchase of female slaves for sex was lawful from the perspective of Islamic law, and this was the most common motive for the purchase of slaves throughout Islamic history. One rationale given for recognition of concubinage in Islam is that it satisfied the sexual desire of the female slaves and thereby prevented the spread of immorality in the Muslim community. Most schools restrict concubinage to a relationship where the female slave is required to be monogamous to her master, though the master's monogamy to her is not required, but according to Sikaina, in reality, however, female slaves in many Muslim societies were prey for male members of their owner's household, their owner's male neighbors, and their owner's male guests. The history of slavery in Islamic states and of sexual relations with slaves, was the responsibility of Muslims, and not of the Quran. According to Parway, as quoted by Clarence Smith, Amir Ali blamed the history of Islamic slavery in racist terms, states Clarence Smith, stating that slave servitude and sexual abuse of captive slaves may have been because of degeneration of the Arabs from their admixing over time with lower races such as Ethiopians. Rape Rape is considered a serious sexual crime in Islam, and can be defined in Islamic law as "...forcible illegal sexual intercourse by a man with a woman who is not legally married to him, without her free will and consent." Rape is forbidden under Islamic law. It is defined as having extramarital intercourse by force or fear, including any subsequent injury both to the victim's mental and physical health. According to Islamic law, it is classified as hiraba, i.e. a violent crime causing disorder in the land in the manner described in the Quran as fasad destructive mischief. A similar crime, for example, would be highway robbery, as it puts fear in people going out or losing their property through violence. Some other branches of Islamic law consider it to be part of zina, as a crime called forced fornication. Zina bil jab. In sharia, rape is punishable by stoning to death. When a woman went out in the time of the Prophet for prayer, a man attacked her and overpowered raped her. She shouted and he went off, and when a man came by, she said, that man did such and such to me. And when a company of the emigrants came by, she said, that man did such and such to me. They went and seized the man whom they thought had had intercourse with her and brought him to her. She said, yes, this is he. Then they brought him to the Messenger of Allah. When he the prophet, was about to pass sentence, the man who actually had assaulted her stood up and said, Messenger of Allah, I am the man who did it to her. He the prophet, said to her, Go away, for Allah has forgiven you. But he told the man some good words, Abudawud said, meaning the man who was seized, and of the man who had had intercourse with her, he said, Stone him to death. He also said, He has repented to such an extent that if the people of Medina had repented similarly, it would have been accepted from them. Under Islam, sexual intercourse is regarded as a loving act within marriage and should only be by mutual consent. There is, however, no explicit concept of rape within marriage in Sharia. A wife is deemed to have accepted conjugal relations as part of the marriage contract. She can only refuse on grounds which are specified as prohibited for sexual intercourse such as when she is fasting, menstruating, undergoing post-natal puerperal discharge, or whilst on Hajj or Umrah. Classical Islamic law defined what today is commonly called rape as a coercive form of fornication or adultery zin. This basic definition of rape as coercive zin meant that all the normal legal principles that pertain to Zinat's definition, punishment and establishment through evidence, were also applicable to rape. The prototypical act of Zin was defined as sexual intercourse between a man and a woman over whom the man has neither a conjugal nor an ownership right. Sane adult male and female convicted of Zin were to receive a fixed corporal punishment had 100 lashes and exile for one year for unmarried free persons Stoning to death for married or previously married free persons, zin was established, according to classical law, through confession by one or both parties as well as proof. A second type of evidence, pregnancy in an unmarried, unowned woman, was contested between the schools. The stringent evidentiary and procedural standards for implementing the zin punishment may have functioned to offset the severity of the punishment itself, an effect that seems to have been intended by legal authorities, who in the early period developed legal maxims encouraging averting the had punishments as much as possible, whether through claiming ambiguity or a lack of legal capacity 
What distinguished a prototypical act of zin from an act of rape, for the jurists, was that in the prototypical case, both parties act out of their own volition, while in an act of rape, only one of the parties does so. Jurists admitted a wide array of situations as being coercive in nature, including the application of physical force, the presence of duress, or the threat of future harm either to oneself or those close to oneself. They also included in their definition of coercion. The inability to give valid consent, as in the case of minors, or mentally ill or unconscious persons. Muslim jurists from the earliest period of Islamic law agreed that perpetrators of coercive zin should receive the had punishment normally applicable to their personal status and sexual status, but that the had punishment should not be applied to victims of coercive or nonconsensual zin due to their reduced capacity. According to the Maliki, Hanbali, and Shafi schools of law, the rape of a free woman consisted of not one but two violations a violation against a right of God. Hak Allah, provoking the had punishment, and a violation against a human interpersonal right Hak Adami, requiring a monetary compensation. These jurists saw the free woman, in her proprietorship over her own sexuality boo, as not unlike the slave owner who owns the sexuality of his female slave. For them, in the same way that the slave owner was entitled to compensation for sexual misappropriation, the free woman was also entitled to compensation. The amount of this compensation, they reasoned, should be the amount that any man would normally pay for sexual access to the woman in question, that is, the amount of her dower or mar. As far as abortion in the context of rape, most jurists do not consider rape to be a valid reason. The sanctity of the new life takes precedence over the autonomy of the pregnant women, however, some women in the Middle East were arrested after they went to the police to report rapes. Restrictions on sexual intercourse Sexual intercourse is prohibited during menstruation for 40 days after childbirth puerperium, during the daylight hours of the month of Ramadan i.e. while fasting on pilgrimage, while in the sanctuary in Aram at Mecca, pilgrims are not allowed to have intercourse. Marriages performed during the pilgrimage are invalid, do not marry idolatresses until they believe, a believing slave woman is better than idolatrous even if she pleases you and let your women not be married with idolater, a believing slave man is better than idolater even if he pleases you, they call towards fire and God calls you toward paradise and forgiveness with his will, and he explains his verses so that you may understand, all Quran 2-221, Marriage with an idolatrous or idolater is forbidden 2 to 221. As well as marriage to one's father's wives 422, one's mother, daughters, sisters, father's sisters, mother's sisters, brother's daughters, sister's daughters, foster mothers, foster sisters, mother-in-law, stepdaughters born of women with whom one has had conjugal relations, the wives of blood sons, and two sisters from the same family 423, as well as all married women except who have become slaves as their previous marriage ends on becoming slave 324. Topic. Sodomy Yusuf al Quradawa, a contemporary Sunni Muslim scholar, states that sodomy is prohibited. As the act is forbidden in the Islamic marriage contract, a wife must abstain from it should her husband demand it and may seek divorce if her husband persists or tries to force it on her. The act in itself, however, does not nullify the marriage and the wife must seek divorce if she is to leave her husband. Muslim scholars justify the prohibition on the basis of the Quranic verse 2 to 223, saying that it commands intercourse only in the vagina, i.e., potentially procreational intercourse. The vaginal intercourse may be in any manner the couple wishes, that is, from behind or from the front, sitting or with the wife lying on her back or on her side. There are also several hadith which prohibit sodomy. Islamic law establishes two categories of legal, sexual relationships, between husband and wife, and between a man and his concubine. All other sexual relationships are considered zin fornication, including adultery and homosexuality, according to Islamic law and exegesis of the Quran. From the story of Lot it is clear that the Quran regards sodomy as an egregious sin. The death by stoning for people of Sodom and Gomorrah is similar to the stoning punishment stipulated for illegal heterosexual sex. There is no punishment for a man who sodomizes a woman because it is not tied to procreation. 
However, other jurists insist that any act of lust in which the result is the injecting of semen into another person constitutes sexual intercourse. Sodomy often falls under that same category as sex between an unmarried man and women engaging in sexual acts. Male male intercourse is referred to as lawa, literally, joining, while female female intercourse is referred to as sahak, literally, rubbing. Both are considered reprehensible acts, but there is no consensus on punishment for either. Some jurists define zin exclusively as the act of unlawful vaginal penetration, hence categorizing and punishing anal penetration in different ways. Other jurists included both vaginal and anal penetration within the definition of zin and hence extended the punishment of the one to the other. Religious discourse has mostly focused on sexual acts, which are unambiguously condemned. The Quran refers explicitly to male-male sexual relations only in the context of the story of Lot, but labels the sodomites as actions universally understood in the later tradition as anal intercourse and abomination. Female-female relations are not addressed. Reported pronouncements by Muhammad hadith reinforce the interdiction on male-male sodomy, although there are no reports of his ever adjudicating an actual case of such an offense, he is also quoted as condemning cross-gender behavior for both sexes, but it is unclear to what extent this is to be understood as involving sexual relations. Several early caliphs, confronted with cases of sodomy between males, are said to have had both partners executed, by a variety of means. While taking such precedents into account, medieval jurists were unable to achieve a consensus on this issue. Some legal schools prescribed capital punishment for sodomy, but others opted only for a relatively mild discretionary punishment. There was general agreement, however, that other homosexual acts including any between females were lesser offenses, subject only to discretionary punishment. Currently, sodomy is punishable by death in a number of Muslim countries, including Saudi Arabia and Yemen, as well as in Nigeria's Sharia courts. <laughs> Oral sex In Islam, oral sex between a husband and wife is considered Makra tarimi, or highly undesirable by some Islamic jurists when the act is defined as mouth and tongue coming in contact with the genitals. The reason behind considering this act as not recommended is manifold, the foremost being the issue of modesty, purification and cleanliness. The most common argument states that the mouth and tongue are used for recitation of the Quran and for the remembrance of Allah dhikr. The status of genital secretions is debated among the four Sunni schools, some scholars viewing it as impure and others not. Topic. Purification and hygiene After partaking in sexual activity where penetration or ejaculation occurs, both men and women are required to complete a full-body ritual ablution known as ghusl in order to re-establish ritual purity before prayer. Ghusl requires clean, odorless water that has not been used for a previous ritual and begins with the declaration of the intention of purity and worship. A Muslim performing complete ablution then washes every part of his or her body. Topic. Fasting and Ramadan It is made lawful to you to go into your wives on the night of the fast, they are an apparel for you and you are an apparel for them. Allah knew that you acted unfaithfully to yourselves, so he has turned to you mercifully and removed from you this burden, so now be in contact with them and seek what Allah has ordained for you, and eat and drink until the whiteness of the day becomes distinct from the blackness of the night at dawn, then complete the fast till night, and have not contact with them while you keep to the mosques, these are the limits of Allah, so do not go near them. Thus does Allah make clear his communications for men that they may guard against evil. According to Quranic verse 2-187, one may have sex during the month of Ramadan but not during the time of fasting. As such, sex during Ramadan is only permitted at night. Although this passage is explicitly addressed to men, the regulations on sex in regard to fasting are universally taken to apply equally to both male and female Muslims. Menstruation And they ask you about menstruation. Say, it is an illness, therefore keep aloof from the women during the menstrual discharge and do not go near them until they have become clean, then when they have cleansed themselves, go into them as Allah has commanded you, surely Allah loves those who turn much to Him, and He loves those who purify themselves. Verse 2-222 in the Quran implies that sexual relations during menstruation are prohibited. 
However, unlike Jewish tradition, Islam does not forbid men from interacting with menstruating women entirely. Ibn Kathir, a Mahadith, narrated a hadith that describes Muhammad's habits with his menstruating wives. This hadith demonstrates that Muhammad gave license to all forms of spousal intimacy during the period of menstruation with the exception of vaginal intercourse. Women are required to perform ritual cleansing before resuming religious duties or sexual relations upon completion of her menstruation. Nocturnal emission Nocturnal emission is not a sin in Islam. Moreover, whereas a person fasting in Ramadan or otherwise would normally be considered to have broken their fast by ejaculating on purpose during either masturbation or intercourse, nocturnal emission is not such a cause. They are still required to bathe prior to undergoing some rituals in the religion. Muslim scholars consider ejaculation something that makes one temporarily ritually impure, a condition known as junab, meaning that a Muslim who has had an orgasm or ejaculated must have a ghusl, before they can read the Quran or perform the formal prayer known as salat. Masturbation <inaudible> 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 According to most jurists, masturbation is generally considered haram or prohibited in Islam. But there are varying opinions on the permissibility of masturbation. The Quran has been cited as being ambiguous on the issue of masturbation. The hadith regarding masturbation are, too, not considered to take a definitive stance on the subject. As such, positions on masturbation vary widely. According to al-Din Tarbiya, it is permissible if done out of necessity. He also permitted masturbation as a means whereby soldiers, far away from their wives on a tour of duty may remain chaste. The four Sunni schools of jurisprudence known as Madahib, the Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki and Hanbali schools of fiqh have differing stances on the issue. Some see it forbidden in certain cases i.e. if it leads a man, woman to ignore their spouse sexually but recommended it when they see it as a lesser evil to illicit sex. It is generally prohibited according to the Hanafi and Hanbali mazabs, unless one fears adultery or fornication, or is under the desire pressure, in which case, it is permissible to seek a relief through masturbation. According to Ahmed ibn Hanbal, it is permissible for prisoners, travelers and for men and women who have difficulty in finding a lawful spouse. It is prohibited all the time according to the Maliki and Shafi backquote mazabs. It is haram in Shiite jurisprudence. There has always been a view to permit masturbation as the lesser of two evils so as to ward of falling into fornication. Thus it is categorically incorrect to state that all Islamic scholars of the early Islamic age have unanimously agreed upon its complete prohibition. Jurists distinguish between those who masturbate out of necessity and those who have these means yet still masturbate to gratify their lust. Topic. Contraception. The Quran does not contain explicit text regarding contraception. Muslims refer to the hadith on the question of contraception. According to Muslim scholars, birth control is permitted, when it is temporary and for a valid reason. The companions of Muhammad are cited when addressing this issue. For example, Habir, one of Muhammad's companions, relates a hadith in which a man came to Muhammad and said, I have a slave girl, and we need her as a servant and around the palm groves. I have had sex with her, but I am afraid of her becoming pregnant." The Prophet responded, Practice coitus interruptus with her if you so wish, for she will receive what has been predestined for her. As such, the withdrawal method of contraception is allowed according to the hadith. Muslim jurists concur with its permissibility and use analogical deduction to approve other forms of contraception e.g. condom usage. Supporting sunnah include A man said. Apostle of Allah, I have a slave girl and I withdraw from her while having intercourse, and I dislike that she becomes pregnant. I intend by intercourse what the men intend by it. The Jews say that withdrawal method is like burying the living girls on a small scale. He the prophet said, The Jews told a lie. If Allah intends to create it, you cannot turn it away. O oh Allah's Apostle. We get female captives as our share of booty, and we are interested in their prices. What is your opinion about coitus interruptus? The Prophet said, Do you really do that? It is better for you not to do it. No soul that which Allah has destined to exist, but will surely come into existence. 
Topic: <laughs> Sterilization. It is not permitted to carry out operations on men or women that will lead to complete sterility, such as cutting the vas deferens vasectomy in men, or removing the ovaries or womb hysterectomy or ligation in women. Irreversible methods of contraception and birth control called sterilization are not allowed for both male and female, except in the case of the wife who becomes terminally ill and perpetually incapable of having babies. Therefore, if the sterilization is irreversible and cannot be undone, it will not be permissible unless the woman is terminally ill. Under normal circumstances, sterilization is considered to be absolutely and decidedly prohibited in Sharia. The irreversible nature associated with both the male and female sterilizations clearly contradicts one of the primary purposes of marriage which is to have children, as mentioned by Abu Hamid al-Ghazali in his Iyya Ulam al-Din. Furthermore, sterilization is a form of mutilation of one's body mudla, which has been clearly forbidden in the Sharia. Allah Most High mentions in Anisa the words of Satan, when he said, I will mislead them, and I will create in them false desires, I will order them to slit the ears of cattle and to deface the fair nature created by Allah. However, in cases of absolute necessity, sterilization does become permitted. The well-known principle of Islamic jurisprudence based on the guidelines of the Quran and Hadith states, necessities make prohibitions lawful. Being sterilized permanently may mean one of two things. It may be done out of necessity, such as if it is determined by trustworthy medicinal evidence that pregnancy will pose a danger to the mother's life, and there is no hope of a cure, so permanent sterilization will ward off that danger. In this case it is permissible to be sterilized. When there is no need for it. Undoubtedly in this case it is a criminal act and a major sin, because it is a transgression against the creation of Allah for no reason, and preventing the production of offspring which was encouraged by the Prophet peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, and being ungrateful for the blessing of children which Allah bestows upon his creation. And it is not permissible to do anything that will put a stop to pregnancy. The Islamic Fiqh Council stated the following, it is haram to sterilize both men and women, if there is no necessary reason for doing so unless there is a necessity which is to be determined according to the guidelines set out by Sharia. It is permissible to take temporary measures to space pregnancies or prevent them for a limited period of time, if there is a legitimate Shari need to do so, so long as this decision is made on the basis of mutual consultation and approval between the spouses. That is subject to the condition that no harm should result from that, and that the means should be acceptable according to sharia, and that there should be no harm caused to an existing pregnancy. Based on this, if preventing pregnancy is for a legitimate reason as outlined above, then there is nothing to do anything. But if it was not for a necessary reason, then sterilizing is prohibited. Topic. Castration Castration is removal of the testicles. The Arabic word translated here as castration may also refer to removal of the testicles and penis. Some scholars differentiated between the two and said, if his testicles only are cut off, then he is a eunuch, if his penis is cut off, then he is emasculated. It is prohibited for a person to do that deliberately to himself or to someone else. Castration of the human is prohibited in Islam, whether he is a child or an adult, because of the prohibition on hadith on that. Ibn Hajar said, It is prohibited, therefore it is haram, and there is no difference of opinion concerning that in the case of the sons of Adam i.e., humans. Among the reports that confirm this prohibition is the following Prophet Muhammad's era, when some followers wanted to be castrated in absence of their wives, but the Prophet forbade it and permitted three days temporary marriage for them for a certain period, but after the period he declared it permanently forbidden. Abdullah b. Masad reported, we were on an expedition with Allah's messenger may peace be upon him and we had no women with us. We said, should we not have ourselves castrated? He, the holy prophet, forbade us to do so he then granted us permission that we should contract temporary marriage for a stipulated period giving her a garment, and Abdullah then recited this verse, those who believe do not make unlawful the good things which Allah has made lawful for you, and do not transgress. Allah does not like transgressors all Quran, v. 87. Sabra al-Juhani reported on the authority of his father that while he was with Allah's messenger may peace be upon him he said, Zero people, I had permitted you to contract temporary marriage with women, but Allah has forbidden it now until the day of resurrection. 
So he who has any woman with this type of marriage contract he should let her off, and do not take back anything you have given to then as dower. According to the Hadith of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, the Messenger of Allah blessings and peace of Allah be upon him forbade Uthman ibn Mazun to be celibate. If he had given him permission, we would have gotten ourselves castrated. It was narrated from Salama bin Ra bin Zinba, that, his grandfather came to the Prophet and he had castrated a slave of his. The Prophet manumitted the slave in compensation for having been mutilated. Narrated Katada, Samura reported the Messenger of Allah as saying, Whoever kills his slave we shall kill him, and whoever cuts the nose of his slave we shall cut off his nose. If anyone castrates his slave, we shall castrate him. Ibn Hajar said, commenting on these hadiths, The reason behind the prohibition on castration is that it is contrary to what the lawgiver wants of increasing reproduction to ensure continuation of struggle against the disbelievers. Otherwise, if permission had been given for that, then many people would have done that, and reproduction would have ceased, and the numbers of Muslims would have become less as a result, and the numbers of non-Muslims would have increased, and that is contrary to the religious purpose. In vitro fertilization Regarding the response to in vitro fertilization IVF of Islam, the conclusions of Gad el Haq Ali Gad el Haq's art fatwa include that IVF of an egg from the wife with the sperm of her husband and the transfer of the fertilized egg back to the uterus of the wife is allowed, provided that the procedure is indicated for a medical reason and is carried out by an expert physician. Since marriage is a contract between the wife and husband during the span of their marriage, no third party should intrude into the marital functions of sex and procreation. This means that a third party donor is not acceptable, whether he or she is providing sperm, eggs, embryos, or a uterus. The use of a third party is tantamount to zina, or adultery. <inaudible> Abortion Islamic schools of law have differing opinions on abortion, though it is prohibited or discouraged by most. However, abortion is allowed under certain circumstances, such as if the mother's health is seriously threatened. If the abortion is necessary to save the woman's life, Muslims universally agree that her life takes precedence over the life of the fetus. Muslim jurists allow abortion in this context based on the principle that what is considered the greater evil, the woman's death, should be warded off by accepting the lesser evil of abortion. In these cases, the physician is considered a better judge than the scholar. Abortions of pregnancies that are merely unplanned or unwanted are generally haram forbidden. The Quran forbids the abortion of a fetus for fear of poverty, kill not your children on a plea of want, we provide sustenance for you and for them kill not your children for fear of want, we shall provide sustenance for them as well as for you, verily the killing of them is a great sin. Muslim views on abortion are also shaped by the hadith as well as by the opinions of legal and religious scholars and commentators. In Islam, the fetus is believed to become a living soul after four months of gestation, and abortion after that point is generally viewed as impermissible. Many Islamic thinkers recognize exceptions to this rule for certain circumstances. Indeed, Aziza Y. Al Hibri notes that the majority of Muslim scholars permit abortion, although they differ on the stage of fetal development beyond which it becomes prohibited, according to Sherman Jackson. While abortion, even during the first trimester, is forbidden according to a minority of jurists, it is not held to be an offense for which there are criminal or even civil sanctions, so Muslims should not support legal restrictions on abortion rights unsupported by Islamic law. As opposed to solely moral activism, most Muslim scholars hold that the child of rape is a legitimate human being and therefore subject to the same laws of abortion i.e. its abortion is permitted only if the fetus is less than four months old, or if it endangers the life of its mother. Some scholars disagree with this position. Some Muslim scholars also argue that abortion is permitted if the newborn might be sick in some way that would make its care exceptionally difficult for the parents e.g. deformities, mental retardation, etc. Topic see also Marriage in Islam Nika Mutah, the Shia fixed term temporary marriage. Misayr the Sunni open-ended, negotiated marriage contract. Repentance in Islam the perfumed garden sexual ethics Wedad Luta, author. Gender roles in Islam Topic Notes Alul Bait Digital Islamic Library Project References Topic References Ayubi, Nazi 2004. Political Islam, Religion and Politics in the Arab World. New York, Routledge, General Suad Joseph, Asana Najmabadi, ed. 2003. 
Encyclopedia of Women and Islamic Cultures, Family, Law, and Politics. Brill. Topic external links Sexual impurity and ritual bathing Gussel article on sexuality in Oxford Islamic Studies Online article, Turning Sex into Sadaqa, from Islam for Today in Urdu Abstaining from Masturbation ProgressiveIslam.org Women's Health Project section on sex, birth control, and pregnancy FSE Project section on Muslim sexual ethics The Modern Religion. Com.